Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. The Jamoti Podcast is powered by Sideline Interactive. Sideline Interactive is the leading manufacturer for high quality, innovative scoring tables and LED video display boards that help coaches and schools bring more excitement to fans, create huge fundraising opportunities, and make their jobs easier. Visit sidelineinteractive.com to check out their amazing products. I'm going to combine these two questions together. What quality <laughs> or qualities do you see in great leaders? And then who, what leaders are you, do you follow closely? There are so many qualities. I think that people try to codify them, but it's what you do, not what you say. Ultimately, Schwarzkopf, when Desert Storm was going on, he was there. He wasn't in the United States. So he put himself on site. And one of the little things that he did speaks volumes, which whether it's Martin Luther King, Gandhi, um, maybe some of your great presidents of the past, one of the things they did is they put themselves in the back of the line in a chow hall. They don't eat first. And then they get in the back of the line and they start talking to some of the people that could be, you know, picking up uh, boxes of rations and stacking them uh, and for distribution later on. And he would ask pregnant questions about what their responsibility was, when their birthday was, something that had to do with flesh and humanness. So number one on a boil down is that the leader is a servant and you can feel it, see it and know it. Number two is they have a set of values. You know, whether it's respect for time, but it's not do as I say, not as I do situation. Now, we all know that everybody has feet of clay, but we're just looking for some basics like Colin Powell. That was a man that was to be um, really everybody should talk to talk about his example as a man with grace with serving the United States of America, uh, et cetera, is that I thought he was a special leader because he had a set of simple values. And you, and he, you felt safe with Colin Powell when he spoke, when you were around him. I had a good friend who was assistant secretary of transportation under Skinner, and he would fly from D.C. to Alaska. He was from uh, where I was born, Fairbanks, Alaska, Wally Burnett. But anyway, he talked about sitting with Colin Powell and Ted Stevens when they take these junkets into Alaska. And that the fact is he was a, a great listener, asked good questions, great listener. But the point is, is that it tethers itself back to respect. You know, they didn't have to show all their hardware, so to speak. And so they have a set of simple values. That would be number two. Number three is compassion. I'll leave it there that you could tell that Mother Teresa was somebody that was a great leader, but she was compassionate. She devoted her whole life to others. And so when you see public servants and you can say whatever you want about our current president, but the one thing you can't attack him on is that he's now passed 50 years of serving in a public forum. And so my point is, I'm not selling the person, I'm selling the quality. And then that way it gets away from some. And I used him in particular because all of a sudden politics comes into the thinking. And I'm saying, change your mindset, yeah. change the premise so you can change the outcome of the vision in your head. Just think about that. And then my question to them to get them back on their heels, if there's an I, and as I'll say, did you have you tell me about your public service? And I'll say, it's only to get them to l listen, not to change their opinion. I said, right. just settle down. And so the, and the point number three is, is that, that, that they all are, are servants in one capacity or another, whether it's the Lions Club, it could be, uh, they, you know, a, a church group where they, they're, they're connected to a soup kitchen. I don't want to really hear about their interpretation of uh, some spiritual thing or the Bible. I'm more interested in the soup kitchen. That is spirit. 
<laughs> you know, and, and, and then I'll say, hallelujah. I don't care if it's Presbyterian or if it's, you know, a temple or, or whatever it is, a synagogue. I, it, it, it doesn't matter to me that. I just want them to have a set of, of things that I can see and they're really uh, tangible and I can feel them and touch them in terms of leadership. So those would be three things that are, are I think are pretty special as a leader. I think I've seen in, in just my experience, some leaders that, whether it's my high school coach, you know, leaders that have those attributes. But then I was thinking about uh, uh, one as a leader, you know, uh, Gannon Baker said, you, you can't coach what you don't possess. Like we have, if I want my leaders at my, at, at my school, my players to possess those attributes, I better be showing those. You know, or right. else it's going to fall on deaf ears. But then I thought about my high school kids, or right? and even college, or and even some pro athletes. That how often is their view of leadership almost the exact opposite of those three things? You can't be compassionate as a leader. That's that's looked at as weak. You've got to be strong. You've got to be hard. You've got to be. You know, you got. Uh, so I'm wondering how how we can help communicate with our younger guys because that list of three that you said is powerful but i think sometimes maybe through social media or what they see or who they're following it doesn't always look that way yeah we had a young man at lmu where i coached in a previous lifetime and his name was eli scott and he came for a particular background where you have hit the nail on the head as far as he saw certain things about me that that he interpreted it as soft and and he would be very um as a, he was 17 when he came to us but he would be very direct uh in a bully kind of way about how i was letting him down as mm -hmm. a head coach and instead of rebuking him i knew it was going to take time in order for him to become more tender and redefine him and the community of LMU was gonna have to raise, you know, it takes a village to raise somebody. And that, that, that the professors there, that um, the people that were the gardeners there, very special people, um, et cetera, the trainer, that exposing him to a myriad of speakers and time, being patient with him, would redefine that because just because we know what leadership looks like and feels like doesn't mean that our youth are going to get all that or even like what we say at the beginning and that's coaching is to understand is that you're going to be lonely you're going to be rebuked by your best players at times and that there will be transferable truths down the road i mean uh, that, that in many ways, that's what happened in Charlotte. I came in, I was very hard on a group. I put a high standard in and I coached the youth. And there were some veterans that didn't like the way I did what I did. The voice got loud and I got fired. It's fine, you know, but I think that the work ethic needed to change. Some things were put into place that I was asked to do. I didn't like the taste of being fired, but I understood that we won three more times games than the previous team had done. And we needed to probably win 28 to 32 in order for me to survive <clears throat> on a number because that's the pro life. But my point is, is that, and I could have been a lot better as a coach in a lot of other ways. But my point is on leadership and understanding your audience, sometimes you're gonna do things as a coach that are gonna be punishing to you in that chair of right. leadership where you're just flat out lonely but you down in your heart you know that when you're not playing a player who's repeatedly late that it could cost you and the guy with the rolex who writes big checks is going to be upset with you because he doesn't well you're a hard ass or you're old school or you're whatever but he wasn't there day in and day out and understood that this young man's life or young lady's life depends upon that lesson Mm -hmm. depends upon that lesson to say no it means no and there are consequences for actions and all of a sudden we end up being soup and we're you know want to be perceived by the guy with the rolex 
as a, a man for all seasons, a coach that can get along, and yet you know that you're going to shortcut it, and that young man or that young lady is ultimately going to get a DUI because they felt that they could break the rules and get away with it. That it, it doesn't work. And yet that's why your teachers in kindergarten are so important mm. and we're so skewed in the money we pay them. We should be paying them more money than we pay a professor. No question about it, because you're talking about the beginning yeah, the basics. and those people, yeah. that's yeah. right. And they have to be very talented to access the child in order that they go from one step lockstep to another to understand what no means, what yes means, how learning evolves. It, it goes into a, a whole host of things and I'm getting up on a soapbox. I'll get off of it right now. <laughs> but my, my point is, you know, on leadership, the most powerful thing I say is that evaluate, if you're a coach, your own behavior. You know, on one end, um, there was a certain coach who's in the Hall of Fame, but when we, and he ran academies, and I, I went and I listened to him speak a lot, and he had beautiful information, but there is no way I would ever go to this man for discipline, because he couldn't discipline himself, and he was abusive towards his players, and he was abusive towards his son who played for him, and I'm watching him, and I'm going, are you kidding me? You are talking about discipline and in front of an academy of 400 coaches, and you're the most undisciplined person I've ever seen on how you treat officials, how you treat your own players, how when you don't get your way, you explode and you're a walking time bomb. And so my point is, we have to be very, very careful about saying that when we're going to get information, that we can go get it from the worst person, so to speak, and take out that chip that's very good without denigrating that person who's undisciplined. In other words, I think it's really, really important when you get back to being a coach that you understand that everybody's going to watch what you do and they're going to know your weaknesses and you have to understand that and accept that. That's why if you say you're going to be on time, then be the gym first to turn the lights on, mop the floor, do whatever, and get right in there with your managers. Because the day that you start showing up and, you know, the assistant's got the players ready and it's all of that is the day that you're going to fall over in the, the, the sight line of a couple of your players. They're going to see it. Thank you for those reminders right there. What are some coaches and leaders that you just personally follow closely you you love to listen to them uh, read up what they're doing well i i always think that brad stevens in the nba is somebody to follow because uh he has a sideline decorum when he was a coach that was second to none hmm. and you always knew that he had high emotional intelligence and he was under control number two is whenever he spoke you knew he was smart he would drop pearls left, right, and center. And he, three is he served uh, the coaches well because if you asked him a specific question, he had no secrets. Where there are a lot of coaches that think that they have secrets, close practices, uh, yada, yada, yeah. yada. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you have no secrets. Stop all this nonsense. But Brad Stevens, as a coach, is somebody who I thought um, and think uh, is very special. I work for a very special man and, and, and coach Budenholzer. Not only did he wait 19 years to be the head coach of the Atlanta Hawks, he was with Popovich. And if you really want to be great at anything that you do, or at least good, <laughs> is that you, the selections that you make with your friends and the people that you choose to be around is everything in a statement. In mm -hmm. other words, it doesn't mean you ignore people that don't exactly have your values, but you move or transition away from them in a reasonably amount uh, of time so that you can, you, you, you know, you can get to the people that not only you love, but also the people that can teach you things. And so I think that, you know, as a, as a writer, I don't think there is a, 
uh, uh, you know, somebody, Jim Collins, I followed him. I found him. I listened to him speak to 32 superintendents in Denver, Colorado. I chased him down because I thought that as a leader, he understood leaders and he was that kind of leader. So I'm weird, but I think Jim Collins deserves to be on that level. David Brooks is somebody who was uber conservative, who has moved his sight line and his heart to a place where he can talk to both sides of the aisle when he writes. So Mm -hmm. I think he's somebody that I like to listen to. Malcolm Gladwell, massive amounts of information and research. He can condense it. So somebody like me who still has a kindergarten understanding of (laughs) high, you know, highfalutin concepts. Uh, I, you know, so I'm weird. Colin Powell, as I mentioned, I, I, anything I can get my hands on, uh, that uh, I've read a, a lot of him. I think he's he's special. But I would suggest this to people, that military people, and especially leadership, the one criteria that is, is not refutable is the fact that they're training thousands of people to have a condition response in the most abject situations where life and death is at stake. Okay, now there are certain people out there listening that will hate that as an example to go to the military to glean certain information. But the most information you can get on human behavior is in the annals of the military because they have to take the most amount of people and get them to act a certain way. And so there's a certain methodology to that. It doesn't have to be life or death in your training. But there are certain beauties that you want to steal from that human behavior. Okay, now you don't like that? I met a guy who did dry needling in Eugene, Oregon. And there are two renowned back surgeons, one out of Canada and one out of the United States. And these people, both surgeons, would go to massive amounts of information. Ah, the military, injury. Okay, what are they doing with backs? And they found out that when back surgery is done, you do not want to damage the fascia when you go in and you cut. And so hence the cuts now on back surgery and shoulder surgery and knees now are through these tiny cuts to save the fascia, which is a pulley system. And I could go on and on. Well, he invited me to listen to the Canadian doctor talked to all of these trainers in Eugene who are dealing with these brilliant runners in injury. And so I said, heck, yeah, I'd love to go because I was there as somebody who didn't belong in the room, just as I didn't belong in the room with Jim Collins. <laughs> but I'm over there with my little yellow pad taking notes on common denominators that are applicable to coaching because I wanted to know about the medical end. So when a player came to me and said, hey, I tore my ACL, and this is the important information on ACLs for people that are out there, you can get it anywhere now, but somebody that's out there that tore their ACL, say it's Joe Ingles at Utah, who's now going to be with the Bucks, they know the math on a retear of the ACL from somebody that's going to get to the hardwood from six to eight months eight months to 12 months and 12 months to 16 months, they can say that being patient and bringing them to the hardwood, regardless of what the trainers have done. And now there's no atrophy in the quad, for example, which is your brake system. And I'll stop myself there. But my point is that I want to know when I'm a coach, when it's safe to put that player on the floor from an ACL, uh, an ACL tear. And I'm weird that way. But my point is, is that it's really important in terms of leadership. When you bring yourself back and you're making these picks, that you don't pick one type of leader, like example given, the cooking channel. Guy Fayette, that guy is hilarious. One. Two is, is that he will make mistakes or make fun of himself. He's self-deprecating. But three is, he's really smart because he's dealing with a cross section of how to cook hamburgers or how to cook a a fancy meal. And he's out there. And I don't know how long he's been going on the cooking channel because a lot of them, whether it's Emerald or this guy or that guy, they drop off because they find their own kingdom. But, you know, 
he has stood the test of time leadership has that leader stood the test of scrutiny and time john wooden pete newell oh my god you want to talk about great leaders those two guys are mount rushmore different style but when i look at great coaches you cannot leave pete newell off that list now you go to red r back and you say bill russell had a certain intelligence was 160 170 iq bill russell you could not trick him to what racism was he said i love being a celtic but i didn't love the celtic fans why this is what i heard they said to the opponents this is what they said to me but he said i love my coach and i love my teammates and that's why i stayed with them because somebody said you were in the bastion of a very tough community we'll put it that way because somebody that's not that way that goes to a Celtic game will say oh you call me a racist no <laughs> I, you know I, I you know that's not what I'm, the point I'm making I'm saying that Red Arback must have been doing something in his way where Bill Russell said you know what I love you and I'll play for this team because you're a leader that gets me um you're of Jewish descent and so we both have been treated in a certain way in society where maybe I'm guessing that there was this commonality between the two. But my point is back to, to leadership. I didn't want to leave Wooden alone. I didn't want to leave Newell alone. But I, then I, I do think you have to go to Martin Luther King. I do think you have to talk about Gandhi. I do think that uh, Mandela. And you saw his arduous journey becoming a great leader before he passed away. Is that all right? Give me somebody else who has that that story. And I mean, it's you know those those people are to be looked at and admired in 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 a in the most positive way. But Mother Teresa, oh my God! I mean, she, her journey and what she did, uh, you know, totally humbling. You know, so those are people that, that just jump out to me. I got to ask this because I, I'm probably like majority of, of of basketball fans, sports fans, that we just get to watch these players and we see whatever they allow us to see on Twitter. We see them at, at games and maybe in a press conference. But in your opinion, what makes Giannis such a special leader? Because to uh, outsiders – I love listening to the way he deflects praise back to the team. And, and, but, but you get to kind of be around him in a different way. You know, and what, what is he like as a leader? Well, the most, the most, the best thing I can say about him for everybody that's listening is manners. As a coach, we all have to inculcate on our players a set of manners. It's important. For example, that you open a door for other people. Some people would say open the door for a young lady or older lady, whatever. I just say that there's to have manners that Giannis has. He has a set of manners. I have never, ever seen him go into any arena, home or away, and warm up. And not finish his warm up by shaking the hand of every ball boy or girl that's under the basket wow. he has a set of humility and 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 sincerity which the gateway are his manners and he will get up out of a chair for anybody male or female and offer a chair he will come to our table when we break bread on the road as a team over to the where the assistants and the head coach sit and we do mingle and all of that but if there's food left over He'll ask if we're going to eat that food. And then if it's something that the players like, he'll bring it over and, and give it to our trainer or give it to other players or whatever. And it's a habit. You are your habits. And so he has a set of manners. He has a set of humility, uh, which are these little connectors, I call them, that he does where and I, you know, you don't go to, to bed in silk pajamas and become a tough guy. In other words, he had a very, very difficult life. It's out on a movie, but, you know, the movies really don't get to 
the life he lived. And they were in a 400 square square foot apartment. There were seven of them total. Hmm. And he had to go sell sunglasses along with two of his older brothers on the street. And when you do that for three years and you know that there's the income will feed your family and do all of these other things in a ripple effect. What happens when you're dealing with a lot of people and you're trying to sell something, there's a bottom line is that you learn about people. And the thing that I would say about Giannis is when you rep it out like that for three years, you understand human nature. And at a young age, I think he, really understood how to make people smile. You know, there is an end game for all of us, but humor is the gateway to a person's heart. And when you can make a person laugh and kind of get rid of their problems for a second and do these things, he is hilarious. And so the other quality, I mean, here he is telling dad jokes. They're the worst jokes in the entire (laughs) world. And he's making the entire press corps laugh joke after joke because you have something that's unpredictable in a very sincere and humble way like you said he's a great deflector and it's the only reason why he stayed in a small market Mm -hmm. he he could have made a lot more money but he understood that he had his family together in a community that loved him in a home chicken soup kind of way It was, hey, we don't have filet mignon in this community, but what we do is have real people that love you that are going to come to the games and and Pendleton's, not everybody. But my point is the masses that are out there that are at a cafe, you know, that 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 Uber that that may Uber them from the airport. These are folks that he knows really, really care for him. Mm -hmm. And he can get that right away in Milwaukee. Whereas maybe in L.A., New York, Miami, you're not going to get quite uh, the diversification of audience is what I would call it. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.